Welcome to the Big Movement Podcast. If you're ready to create results and make huge strides in your business, finances, personal development, and health, then you're in the right place. Pushing past excuses and powering through procrastination can be a challenge alone. Here, you'll get the support, tools, and knowledge you need to get to the level you desire in your business and life. Let's get started with your host, Byron Ingram. And welcome to another episode of the Big Movement Podcast. Today, we have special guests. We have Christina Dubrul, who founded and runs Do North designs limited where it began from crafting a clothing you know in a local marketplace and she's molded the company into a network of over 3,000 distributors in the direct sales industry across north america surpassing over one million dollars in sales per year so let's give a warm welcome to christina so christina welcome thank you so tell me, how did you get into this? I mean, it's it's not every day that, you know, someone just wakes up and decides, I'm going to start something in the clothing industry. Well, so, yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. So I, I come from a social work background. That's what I, that was my professional um, career. And uh, I had three children and I was mat- on maternity leave from my, my last job in social work. And um, they shut down all the offices in Alberta, Canada two weeks before I was scheduled to go back to work. And so I, for anybody that knows the social work industry, they know that it's, it's a very high commitment, high stress place to work. And at that point with three kids, I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Maybe this is my opportunity to do something else. So then I, you know, I've always been really interested in the fashion industry. And um, being that I live in a really rural remote community, we don't have a lot of access to fun fashion. So I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to start sewing clothes. I'm going to sew clothes and sell them and make money. Well, that was a terrible disaster. Trying to sew clothing with three kids, it, it didn't work. Um, so then I kind of <laughs> had to yeah, rethink my plan of action. And so then I just started kind of purchasing from wholesalers and hosting little home shows. This was 3 years ago for my friends and family, throwing a little wine and um and then it just sort of snowballed. It was, you know, people that weren't my friends and family were saying they wanted to host a party and I, it just got to be too much and people from, you know, two, three, four hundred kilometers away wanted me to go see them. And I, you know, I said, well, I can't, but let me see if I can find someone that will basically someone to partner with me in the business, but just buy and sell for me. And, and it sort of snowballed from there to the point three years later, well, we, we've got 3,000 distributors across North America. So it was never really an intentional. I never really sat down one day and said, I want to be an entrepreneur. It just sort of happened. And I, I never would have expected where we're at today. Wow. Now, that's incredible of how it just grew organically because of that mm-hmm. demand of what you're offering. So... What made you decide to go down the direct sales route instead of just offering it straight to consumers? Well, I think I identified a need. So being a mom myself, I hate going clothes shopping because I usually have at least one child in tow. It's painful. You know, you're in the dressing room trying on clothes. It's it, it's not fun. And I always want someone there with me to give opinions when I put clothing on. That's just kind of the nature of women. We just... Hey, how does this look? And I also hate driving anywhere. Um, so that's where I started going. You know, I, I had been to some other direct sales companies, parties myself, and really enjoyed it. I, You know, I enjoyed the social aspect. Again, being a mom, you know, I run around for the kids all the time, don't always necessarily get the social interaction that I want. So I kind of put that all together and just started doing these home parties. Um it's kind of the best of both worlds of not having to shop retail and not having to shop online. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great way to do it. And then what was the reaction when you first got it started? Um, really good. Yeah. It was great. Actually, really good. I I never really had difficulties growing. It, it just kept growing by itself. Um, I had lots of really good support from local families and friends and it's, yeah, I don't know. And I, I figured out social media really quickly. That was, you know, I would spend 80 hours a week on Facebook just figuring it out. And that's really helped okay. the growth as well. So, Now, 80 hours a week, that's quite a bit. What were you doing Everything. during all those hours? Oh, research. Um, for anybody that's familiar with Facebook, like just 
really learning what, what the analytics, what every single tab does and how I could use it to my advantage and then learning Facebook ads and retrying things, then researching why it didn't work and what I needed to do to work and researching my audiences and what, you know, psychologically what speaks to that audience. It was just, I just wanted more information all the time because I quickly saw the value, especially three years ago, especially in Facebook, of, of using it as a marketing tool. And it's still a really awesome marketing tool. It's not quite as organic as it used to be, but it's still a great paid marketing tool. And uh, it's still the bread and butter, bread and butter of the company today. So it was, I just quickly identified that this is the way of the future. Like I'm not putting ads on billboards. I'm not spending any money on print ads anywhere. This is what I need to do. And it, it just worked. Right. It's, it's a very powerful tool when it's leveraged properly because exactly. you, you look at the percentage of population that's on the platform. Mm -hmm. It's oh, huge. No. If we're, Absolutely. You can reach so many people. Absolutely. It's, it's so huge. People, and I find people are even starting to use it almost as a Google type search engine as opposed to Google. Really? Now, how are, have you seen people beginning to do that in your industry? Really using the search bar as a tool. Um, you, okay. uh, using the search bar as a tool. So they, you know, as opposed to going to Google and searching leggings, people are learning that so many people use Facebook as an advertising platform. They're going there now. Now, that is an interesting phenomenon there. So what have you seen from people who are begin searching you out? What type of messages are they sending to you? Typically to join the team. That's a big, big one. You know, they see us, they hop onto our Facebook page, they kind of see what we are, they see that we're a direct sales company, and that's where we get a lot of our reach outs. So they, um, yeah, they're messaging us. And of course, just to buy the leggings, that's another big one, but the biggest is to join the team, so. Oh, that's excellent. So now, obviously, as you've been using social media to grow your the whole platform, what was it like, in, just in terms of that, that scale where you went from being a social worker to now running a direct sales company, what were some of the skills that you had to learn along the way? Because it's quite a transition. Um, well, how to deal with customer service. I mean, I think I was really good at reading people. That was my job before, right, was working with people. So that helped a lot. But certainly customer service and dealing with the public, um, that was a big, big one. I would say that's still a learning curve every single day is how to better your customer service because that's huge. Um, right. That's a big one. Obviously, the, the marketing aspect, I didn't, I didn't go to school for marketing. Um, that was huge. And, and the thing with online inbound marketing is that it changes every single day. So I'm actually a really big believer that even if I did spend four years in school learning about marketing, the reality is in today's world online, you have to be continually teaching yourself new strategies and new ways. And it, it changes every social media platform, their algorithm changes their, you know, the, it, it's just such a fast paced environment. Right. Oh, definitely. You look at the things that you could use three years ago, well, some of those things don't work anymore, or even the ways that you can market yourself today didn't exist three years ago. Exactly. And you think about how many businesses they're still using a blueprint from five, six years ago. We've been marketing this way all the time and they're losing the game of marketing and exactly. growing their business. Exactly. So when I say I spent 80 hours on Facebook three years ago, I still, I mean, we've got three staff working on it, but I still myself spend probably 20 hours a week learning new things on Facebook. I'll pop onto the back end of Facebook ads and something's changed from a week ago. So you have to figure out, okay, what is this? How can I leverage this? So it's, um, it's a ever evolving educational self, um, better. Right. Yeah. It's right. Exactly. And that's so true. They're always changing something. Every time I go in to the Facebook ads platform, I have that one question in my mind. What did they change today? Exactly. Because sometimes it's the most minute change that unless you're looking for it, you would never notice it. But then sometimes it's dramatic, like, oh crap, where did they put that? <laughs> exactly. Or a brand new analytical tool. And you're like, oh wow. Okay. You know, just things like it's, yeah, it's, so then you got to figure out how to use this analytical tool and how to look back at it a week later and see what it's done. And it's, yeah, it's great. 
Right, exactly. Now, speaking of analytics, what type of analytics are have you been using to successfully scale your business? Because to go from essentially start to where you are in this period of time is phenomenal. So what type of analytics have you been using? Um, well, obviously, the Facebook analytics is a huge one. Like, I'm kind of a big believer. You know, I know there are a lot of um, third-party analytical tools that you can use. But typically, the best tools are the ones that are on the platform. So, for example, Google Analytics, we use right. that for a lot, obviously. Um, Facebook Analytics, I've I've looked at some other ones, Social Bakers. There's a few, and I I still go back to the tried and and tested Google Analytics. We don't rely a lot on Instagram, Pinterest. You know, we're just starting to dabble in that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. And the analytics we need from that platform, we get from Google Analytics. So, right. Exactly. You have to, you know, look at what's going to work the most effectively. And if you use the tools that are there, they provide a phenomenal amount of data as, as exactly. a solid baseline. And that's the, the most important thing. Yeah. There's really only one um, third party tool that I've ever used and really liked. And that's really dependent on your business. It's called Gritics. And so it provides group analytics on Facebook because we do utilize groups quite a bit with our distributors. And so that's really the only third party tool that I've really started using and love, but that really has to fit your business. Right. Exactly. It's not every business is leveraging Facebook groups very yeah, well. Exactly. So now as you grew it, you moved into the wholesaling world. How did you decide on like the sources for it and then go about that? Because some people, you know, they're thinking like, maybe I want to create a direct to consumer business, but they're not sure how do they go about that process? Oh, there's no magic answer to that, to be totally honest. You know, it was, you can research all you want online. The problem with that is you never quite know what you're getting into. Um, there are these huge platforms that you can get onto and sign up with. And it's still, I mean, it's not really monitored that well. You're really not quite sure. Um, so it, it was a combination of online research and then a combination of, of attending conferences where these um, wholesalers and manufacturers are at and building relationships. We've dabbled with a lot of different ones and it's just finding that one, they may not give you the absolute best price, but they're the all around best for your business. And right. honestly, we are still three years later trying to source out new ones or trying to negotiate with our current ones. Um, it too is ever evolving. You have to do what's best for your business at that time. But certainly, I mean, online provides a lot of good resources, but in person, nothing replaces that. Right. Oh, definitely. And you mentioned something that I think is critical where people tend to lose sight of. You know, they're looking at sheer profitability, so they want to get the lowest price possible instead of making sure that the quality of the product is going to, and it has, in terms of the service, everything else, meets what you're looking for which is more yeah. important yeah if they take six weeks to ship and you need it in a week but they're you know a little bit cheaper in the in the long run is that going to make you more profit probably not right exactly and, and that just comes down to planning ahead of knowing that if depending on what your order levels are when you're looking at inventory if it takes six weeks then you know that based on the sales rate you need to order it at whatever that particular point that level is in your inventory so you make sure you don't run out. Exactly. Which and, is a struggle. It's still a struggle right. for us today. So. Right. It, it's always giving me that struggle, especially because you don't want to have too much inventory. It's like, great, we have 2,000 pink leggings and we can't do anything with them now. Exactly. And so it, it's a fine art. It, I think that's the difference when you look at a business like yours comparing it to you know like your large retailers where they have the ability to absorb some of those things a lot easier where as a smaller business you just can say eh, let's just put it on clearance and call it a day exactly because they can absorb that exactly which is kind of ironic you know when you think of some of these large retailers i always joke about this during like right after every single holiday if someone really loves candy and decorations just buy it for the next year. Okay, maybe not the candy because it's oh, that would be kind of odd, like giving people like, oh, I bought this candy like two years ago, but it's good. But you think about decorations yeah. like for Christmas, if you really want a tree, just buy it the day after. Look, 75% off, call it a day. Exactly. 
that would that would require a lot of pre-planning, which I mean, I'm notoriously really bad at, which mm -hmm. is why I've actually gone and hired a general manager for the company now. Um, yeah. I'm more a fly by the city of your pants kind of person, but yeah, <laughs> certainly that would be the smart thing to do. Right. So now in terms of your business, you have a, a GM now. What else do you have in terms of a staff that runs it? Well, we have 15 staff now. So we've got, you know, several people that work in the warehouse that, you know, obviously just pack the boxes. We've got a warehouse manager. We've got a social media team. So we've got people that work on all the other platforms, someone that's solely dedicated to Facebook. You know, we've got our accounting team. There's three people on there. And then we've got three people on customer service. So um, it's quite okay. a quite a large team. Well, you know, when you look at it, that's important, you know, that you have those people there because you think about that skill and growth. It's something you can't do yourself. No, absolutely. And that's one of the smartest decisions as a business maker you need to make. At what point do you let go? Because it's really hard to let go. What point do you let go and give it to someone else that can do it better than you? Because the reality is you can't be everything to everyone. If you try to be, you're nothing to anyone. Um, and so sometimes it means not making as much profit or, you know, not doing things, having to sacrifice or bend a little bit in the way you want things done. But at the end of the day, it's the best decision for your business. Right, exactly. It's you have to focus on what's the best thing. So when you were scaling up your business, what position was the first one that you hired? Uh, box packers, people to pack the, pack the orders. I was still doing all the administrative stuff myself. So I still packed boxes for the first year and a half, but I certainly needed help doing that. Now, why the box packers? It was the easiest thing to train someone else to do. In my head, I had the way the business ran, the way everything, you know, and I I'm, I pride myself in being really good at the customer service and really good at the marketing. So those were a lot harder for me to let go of. I, I'm not that much of a person that pays attention to detail. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. you need that when packing orders. So the reality was, is I wasn't very good at that part. So it was identifying, okay, at what point when we were growing, what can I let go of that I'm not very good at right now? What can someone else do better with? And then that's each position that we, you know, we would hire um, with the last being actually some social media marketing, not even the general managing. That was really hard for me to let go of control of that. So I still obviously have control, but not you know i'm not a micromanager that's in there watching every move i trust my staff and i've learned to hire slowly you know in the beginning it was just you know hire whoever we could to fill the position now i hire slowly and i make sure that i really like the person and i think that they have the personality fit to do the job because you can teach the skill and that's kind of how we've gone right. from there right and you know that is something so critical and vital is that they have the right personality because in, unless you're getting into something like, let's say brain surgery, mm -hmm. in most cases you can train almost anybody to do any particular job out there. Absolutely. So it's more important that they're going to be the right fit because you're building a team of people, not just a gaggle of dysfunctional individuals. Exactly. But you think about how many times, people do the opposite they just want to get whoever into that spot like oh well they can do it and then you realize what type of a train wreck they're causing because they're abrasive or they're just not the right fit and i've been there too so now yeah our motto when we do interviews is hire slowly fire quickly if someone's not fitting in with your team you can't teach that right exactly that's something that they have to develop themselves exactly Otherwise, you find yourself just running an office that doesn't really generate the business that you're looking for. And the interesting thing is, is we really struggled. Um, we hired a few staff members about nine or ten months ago, and we hit an absolute low of the business. Um, and we had to identify, like, hey, what's going wrong here? Why have sales tanked? Why are we losing our customers that have been faithful to us for so long? And... Um, you know, it, it came down to just not having the right people on the front line and a few other things, but that was a big, big one. So we, it, it is extremely important. Good staff makes or break your business and you, you have to appreciate every little thing they do. 
Right, exactly. You know, it's it's something that culture makes a world of a difference. I think in terms of culture, if you look at businesses out there, a great example is if you look at some of the ones in the tech industry, like Google, where it's, mm -hmm. they do so much to nurture and build that relationship that they have to be extremely selective on in the beginning to make sure that someone's the right fit for it. Exactly. Otherwise, you know, you go through exactly what you experience, wondering why are things just tanking that things are not working, and then you realize, oh, it's teamwork. Exactly. We actually require all our interviewees to do, do you know the Briggs and Myers personality test? Yes. We require everyone to do that in their interview. It doesn't mean we're not going to hire someone based on a personality, but just so that we know where they're at and know, okay, is that going to be a good fit here? So it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, and you know, that's fascinating that you do that because when you use the personality assessments like Myers-Briggs and so forth, you can also see if someone's, not only if they have the right personality, which is going to fit well with everybody else, but if they're going to have the right personality for that position. Exactly. Because I yeah, think so many people, they forget about that. Exactly. You don't necessarily you want an at... introvert that doesn't like talking to people, heading your customers. Oh, gosh, no. Right? <laughs> you can't always tell that from an interview, whether or not someone is a, a, an absolute introvert, right? So. Right. Yeah. Right? There, there's some people, they will stare at the phone like, oh, my gosh, I can't do it. I'm going to panic. And they're literally just starting to sweat themselves to death because they can't pick up the phone. And someone else will go, Okay, who do you want me to call? And they're calling that person's cousin's neighbor before you know it. Because exactly. they, there's nothing that's holding them back. Exactly. So it's it's that process to be able to identify exactly you know, what's going to work, which makes all the difference. So now, in terms of really scaling and growing it, you know, so I looked at your website. How many iterations of your website have you gone through in the past three years? Like how many website changes? Yes. Like how many versions of it? God, it's never stopped. <laughs> um, <laughs> two, three, three big ones, and we're working on another one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's um, that in itself is a whole world that I'm still learning and learning on, you know, who to hire. Part of, you know, the several of them that we've had to do. Um, mm hmm we're just due to the work not being done correctly the first time. But um, yeah, even that, it's ever evolving. You figure out, okay, we need this tool on the website now. So if you've been on the website in the last couple of weeks, it's actually a little bit less than it was because we're prepping for a whole new rollout in hopefully the next two weeks. So we had to kind of scale things yeah. back while we were updating and making changes on our staging site. Um, and then mm -hmm. once that rolls out, it's going to look completely different again. So it's, it's um, yeah, that's a websites that's a whole a whole nother world in itself oh yes it always is so, you no know, the first version of the when you launched your company did you build the site yourself or did you have somebody do it for you no i just had like one of those like build it yourself off the shelf websites um never anticipating obviously that we would get to the size that we were and we were really good at um making accommodations for what the website couldn't do. Like we had all these little tricks here and there and use coupons for this and that for that. And, um, you know, I'm really grateful that our customers are really patient with us because especially in a world where there is some really great websites out there, but I know how much those really great websites cost and knew that we couldn't afford to do that yet. So, um, you have to be really innovative, I, I think to keep up and, just get a really good website guy because otherwise it's it's a struggle. Right. But, you know, you hit something on the head there, which I think is super important for people who are thinking about going into the whole e-commerce arena. It start where you can. It's not, well, I'm going to wait until things are perfect. Exactly. Because you look at all the little workarounds, the, the little tricks that you came up with because you knew that you needed to get to a specific goal and you figure out a way to do it because it goes back to, down to the expression. It's never a lack of resources. It's a matter of resourcefulness. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. And that's what you had to do was just become as resourceful as possible to achieve the results that you're looking for. And we still do that. We still find workarounds sometimes when, you know, it's a balance between, is it worth spending that much money 
on changing something on your site or is there a way you can work around it for a little while so it's yeah but i mean right. if i have any and advice to anybody it's hire extremely slowly when you're when you're thinking of if you don't get in over your head Building a website is not as easy as click one, two, three, if you've never done it. Um, I've been working on the back end of websites. We, we use WooCommerce and WordPress for, you know, we've had this website for over two years now. And there's still so much I learn every day. Um, so, you know, not that I say don't try and do it yourself. There are lots of that you can, but don't try and go big yourself if you have no idea what you're doing because you will get lost very quickly. And when you are hiring, do tons of research, references, due diligence, because um, there, it, yeah. Right. And, well, that's important because it's so easy to have things go wrong where you'll have someone say, "Oh yes, we can build it for you," and then they're like, "Who commerce? What the heck is that?" And that's exactly what we ran into. So everybody says they can do it. Um, 300 hours later, you get the bill and they still haven't done it. So it's, yeah, do lots of research, due diligence. Right, exactly. Because that's what makes a ton of a difference. And, you know, these days, when you look at it, too, if someone's just getting started, you know, WordPress, well, yeah, you could do a lot of stuff with it. But in some cases, for a lot of people, it's easy just to use a platform like Shopify. Like here, you want yeah. your store, there it is. And Shopify is great. It's wonderful if you're, you know, if you're just selling yourself, it's, it's great. I, I think it's a great platform. Once you need something a little bit more robust, it sometimes gets difficult, but yeah, it's, it's a great platform. GoDaddy has some good, some good tools that you can use. Like there's lots of easy stuff to use out there, but again, don't jump in with both feet till you've really done your research and you know what you're doing. Cause it's not maybe as easy as everyone says, if you have no experience. Right, exactly. It's it's something that people don't think about it. Where, when it comes to building that whole platform, you start off with something that's easy, that's that low cost to entry, so you're not having to use that as an excuse to stop you. So sure, use the Shopify's, you can use the Squarespaces and whatever else there is out there to get at least get yourself going. And then as the revenue comes into play, you can start looking at, well, where do I need to be out of my business before it makes logical sense to spend a couple thousand dollars on the next version of the site? Exactly. And that's where I think a lot of businesses go wrong. They're not looking at that. So what ends up happening is they still have that basic looking site. And then they're wondering, you know, two years down the road, why is my business starting to slow down? Well, because your site is not keeping up with everything else out there. Exactly. And people also have this notion of if I build it, they will come. Oh, yeah. Which is not. <laughs> well, I have a website. Nobody's buying. Right. Right. But that's like building a store in the middle of nowhere. I'm just right. expecting people to drive to you. It's not going to happen. You have to get right. in there. Right. So now in the beginning, once you had, well, obviously after you got your site going, what have you been doing to drive traffic to your site primarily? Social media. Okay, now what are you doing specifically on social media to drive traffic? Um, so I don't know if you've been on our Facebook ads, but we've got a really, or sorry, our Facebook. We've got a really busy Facebook. So not only do we have a, like a, you know, we're pretty proud of our 140,000 likes, but our engagement every week is about 14,000. So we keep people very engaged on Facebook so that when we do feed out those, you know, um, you know, those sale ads and whatnot, it's organically reaching them. But then every, just about every single dollar in our marketing budget is spent on Facebook. There's a few things we use here and there. You know, we do some retargeting ads online and that sort of stuff. But for the most part, we just make sure we're spending it well and we spend everything on Facebook. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great thing to do. If When you find something that's working for you like that, it makes a dramatic difference you know, exactly. at the end of the day. Exactly. And now, obviously, when you're doing that, like in terms of the ads that you're running, what have you found most effective in your industry in terms of e-commerce and direct sales? Um, you mean like what type of Facebook ad? Yeah. So what type of Facebook ads have you been utilizing the most effectively? 
Um, so like when we're targeting, we don't target retail anymore because we're a pretty like little fish in a big pond. You know, when we're trying to compete against big names like Walmart and Old Navy and some of those huge, huge companies. So we don't actually, we don't target that at all anymore. So we just target people to basically join our team. So that's been a big thing for us and we get a, a really good return on that. Um, I'm a big fan of actually boosting existing posts. Um, we get a really good cost per click and a really good relevance score on those. Um, yeah. And I find, and we track all of, you know, we can track where our, our customers have come from, uh, the people that have, you know, followed through and become a, a darling, we call them. Um, and it's over 95% are from those um, boosting just a post. We do do some, you know, link clicks, some, I've tried the forms. I'm not a big fan of it. So it's, again, it's trial and error. And like we discussed earlier, Facebook changes all the time and they add something new or they add another option. So you try that out a little bit, but my tried and trusted, um, and I don't know if that's because we already have such good engagement on our posts is just boosting posts. Right. Well, in most, so many cases, that's a great way to do it because when you have a loyal following, they want to actively engage with you to be part of that community instead of feeling like, hey, we've got this great thing for sale. You want to buy it? Exactly. And well, the other thing is too, is it's not quite as obvious that it's an advertisement when you do it that way, right? So right. I don't know if people feel less offended by it, but I just find that it works just a whole lot better. Right, exactly. It it makes a tremendous difference when something doesn't feel like an ad because you think about the amount of times that you look at your newsfeed and you see ads that are there and some of them, they're just so blatant like, hey, I want you to buy this because I'm going to solve all your world's problems oh. with this one pill and you're going to love it. And you're or like, make Nick. seven digits in three months. You know, right. Dollars. Ah, uh, no, that's not going to happen. But yeah, for sure. Right. So you have people that are putting these just tremendous claims out there instead of build the engagement, build a community of followers. You've helped solve a problem that people are having because that's what people are buying all the time. People want solutions at the end of the day. Exactly. And that's what you have to focus in on. So obviously it sounds like you're doing a lot of boosting a post. When you first got started, what were you typically spending in ads? Because some people are thinking like, oh my gosh, like, how can I do this if I have a limited budget? Oh, when I first started? Oh gosh, we spent, I don't know if it was more than $20 a week when I first started. Oh wow. Yeah, it was pretty low when I first started. And then, you know, Granted, when I first started, it was a lot easier to get organic growth than it is now. Um, but yeah, and even today, even with the size that we have, depending on the time of the year, we might only be spending 40 to $50 a day. I mean, sometimes it's a lot more than that, but just depending on, you know, what we think we can reach at the, any given time, it's, it's not necessarily a huge amount of money. Wow. And, you know, that in itself, that speaks volumes because I think some people, they have this, this notion of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to have to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars a day to achieve this. But you just dispelled that myth of like, you've built this community of raving fans on a budget where most people would be like, wait, you, you can do that? Or they have this sense of disbelief because you're just listening to people. Oh, you've got to spend a massive amount every single day to do this. No. And you know what the 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 best advice i have for that is use the analytics you know do lots of trial and error figure out what posts people are responding to you know you might really love a post but and the other thing is i don't really if i have a relevant score lower than eight i don't run the ad i often have tens and i almost always have nines and that's just about really watching what people are engaging with trying different audiences Tweaking, not leaving, an, you know, not just having a tried and tested audience that I use over and over and over again, because the reality is after a while that audience gets, it doesn't work anymore. So it's, again, right. it's, it's not a just set it and leave it. It's constantly watching, constantly figure out, you know, maybe purple worked better on that ad than red 
like what colors pop in the feeds, those sort of things. That's more important than having a really giant budget, I think. You know, don't get me wrong, a big budget helps, but you don't necessarily get the quality reach that you want from a big budget. Right. And you know, that's the thing so critical you mentioned is, you know, when you look at the relevancy score, the number of people that don't pay attention to that simple thing, and it makes all the difference in the world. Exactly. In terms of your cost per click. Like, oh my gosh, why did it cost so much? Well, because no one likes your ad, so it's going to cost you more. Exactly. And don't hang on to something. You know, if you've run an ad for two days and your cost per click's way too high and you're rel- just kill it. Try something new. Right, exactly. That's the thing because over a period of time, and there's not a set formula when it begins to happen, but an, an ad will lose its effectiveness where it might work great oh, for does. a day or two and then suddenly, poof, nothing. And my other experience is, is you can usually tell it, the – the cost per click and the relevancy score doesn't usually change a whole lot after one day. So you might get a little bit better over time, but it's not going to miraculously get amazing. Right. Exactly. It's, if, it's, if it's not working then and there, well, guess what? It's probably not going to do it at all. Exactly. So it goes back down to the quicker you can be able to identify the winners and then identify the losers, the better you're off you're going to be. And herein lies the 80 hours a week that I used to spend. Because I used to examine every single part of everything that I did, whether it was the audience, the colors, the pictures, the font. And I had a spreadsheet of what worked and what didn't, and yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, when I look at you know clients' ad campaigns, I'm looking at all sorts of data in terms of what demographics, what type of devices are, exactly. are they looking at. I mean, Every little thing that can make a difference, I want to know about it exactly. because it could be something as simple as you know that more people that uh, that actually went all the way through this sales cycle, they're on iPhones, right? Yeah. So that can make a difference. Yeah. You know, where, you know, it could be something as simple and strange as if you know that, let's say you have more buyers for iPhones and you're going to use an image and you want to have someone, let's say, talking on a phone, make sure that phone's an iPhone. Exactly. It can be as crazy as that people think, but that can make a difference. Yes. <laughs> oh, for sure. It, it's insane. Or even, you know, for us, it's the way the legs are positioned, you know, because right. we often use legging pictures, right? The way the legs are positioned in a picture can make all the difference. Right. It might just be a little bit offset to the left, but that one performed mm-hmm. way better than the one in the center. Right. Now, because you have all these images on your site, are you taking the pictures of all the legs yourself or are you using stock imagery for those? Oh, we try. Absolutely. I mean, our struggle right now is because our growth has been, our growth in the last three months has been exponential. I, we tripled our forecasted projection from last year for the months of January and February. Um, and so our struggle obviously is keeping stock, um, which is, a great struggle to have, you know, we can't keep stock long enough to be able to take our own pictures, but our in-house policy is that, you know, we try and take pictures of everything that we can um, through our own photographer and our own models prior to going up. But the reality is, is we need to keep the cash flow going at the same time. So sometimes we use stock photos. We try not to, we try to brand everything and make it unique and make it ours. Right. And you know, that's important because sometimes you, just don't have the ability to do that because you need to get that product out there now instead of, well, you can't have the models and the photographers lined up until let's say next week, but you need the product on the website and ready to go in 24 hours. So you have to use what you have. Yeah. It's a balance. Right. And that's, that's the, I don't want to see the hardships, but that is one of those challenges or opportunities however you want to look at it when it comes to business growth you're going to have times everything's going to line up perfectly and other times you're just going to have to go let's just roll with it exactly because that's just the way it goes yeah so now when you're you're looking at everything you've done what would you say has been one of the the most critical things that's helped you achieve the success that you've had so far to be open to change and to never be okay with the status quo is a big, big one. Um, 
you know, in the business itself, identifying what's working like beyond marketing, you know, what's working in terms of staff and not be afraid of making decisions that involve a big change. People are really afraid of change, but I find especially in the online world, you have to be really okay with change. We've actually done change management courses for our staff because we change so much. Right. And, you, and that's important that you're investing in your staff like that because it's the one thing that will make a di difference from a business becoming stagnant and ones that turn into global empires. Exactly. And that's what is so critical. So if you can just give someone else one other tip that can make a difference besides being open to change, what would it be? Um, be okay with letting go. So it's your baby. Every entrepreneur will know it's your baby, right? That business is your baby, but be okay with letting go of little pieces of it. Um, because good staff is paramount to a good business and you have to trust them. It took me a long time to trust staff. And I think I, I didn't lose good staff, but it took me a lot longer to get them to their potential than it should have. So just, yeah, be okay with letting go when you do find someone that you trust and can do the job. Right, and that is priceless. So as we wrap everything up, how can people be able to reach out and learn more about what you're doing and about the various products that you have? Uh, so they can visit our website, which is do North designs. So D U North um, check out our Facebook. We have a pretty fun Facebook. We run a lot of contests, a lot of just fun, engaging posts on there as well. And so that's just do North designs limited do North designs LTD on Facebook. So. Oh, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for coming on to the big movement podcast today and sharing your wealth of wisdom on growing a business from essentially from conception into a million dollar business. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Big Movement Podcast today. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now that you've surely been inspired to take your entrepreneurial career and business to the next level, you can stop by the website and get more. And if you're ready to boost your business brand, be sure to grab your free report, Seven Easy Steps to Build Your Brand Today.